Hey everyone. All right, so I'm going to read the next chapter, chapter 12. Last thing we read from last chapter says this. The knight who we have learned is Prince Rillian is trying to figure out. He hears people coming and he says, I thought, I have a better thought than that. I will fool these earthmen if Aslan gives me the wit. Take your cue from me. He walked resolutely to the door and flung it wide open. Chapter 12. The Queen of Underlay. Two earthmen enter, but instead of advancing into the room, they place themselves one on each side of the door and bow deeply. They were followed immediately by the last person whom anyone had expected or wished to see, the Lady of the Green Kirtle, the Queen. She stood dead still in the doorway, and they could see her eyes moving as she took in the whole situation. The three strangers, the silver chair destroyed, and the prince free, with his sword in his hands. She turned very white, but Jill thought it was the sort of whiteness that comes over some people's faces, not when they are frightened, but when they are angry. For a moment, the wicks, witch fixed her eyes on the prince, and there was murder in them. Then she seemed to change her mind. Leave us, she said to the two earthmen. And let no one disturb us till I call on pain of death. The gnomes pattered away obediently, and the witch, the witch queen shut and locked the door. How now, my lord prince, she said, has your knightly fit not yet come upon you? Or is it over so soon? Why stand you here unbound? Who are these aliens? And, and is it they who have destroyed the chair, which was your only safety? Prince Rillian shivered as she spoke to him, and no wonder. It is not easy to throw off in half a year, an hour an enchantment which has made one a slave for ten years. Then, with great effort, he said, Madam, there will be no need of that chair. And you, who have told me a hundred times how deeply you pity me for the sorceries by which I was bound, will doubtless hear with joy that they have now ended forever. There was, it seems, some small error in your ladyship's way of treating them. These are my true friends who have delivered me. I am now in my right mind, and there are two things I will say to you. First, as for your ladyship's design of putting me at the head of an army of earthmen so that I may break out into the overworld and there by main force make myself king over some nation that never did me any wrong, murdering their natural lords and holding their throne as a bloody and foreign tyrant, now that I know myself I do utterly abhor and renounce it as plain villainy. Second, I am the king's son of Narnia, Rillian, the only child of Caspian, tenth of that name, whom some call Caspian the Seafarer. Therefore, madam, it is my purpose, as it is also my duty, to depart suddenly from your highness's court into my own country. Please it to grant me and my friends a safe conduct and a guide through your dark realm. Now the witch said nothing at all, but moved gently across the room, always keeping her face and eyes very steadily upon the prince. And when she had come to a little ark set on the wall not far from the fireplace, she opened it and took out the first handful of a green powder. This she threw on the fire. It did not blaze much, but a very sweet, drowsy smell came from it. And all through the conversation which followed, that smell grew stronger and filled the room and made it harder to think. Secondly, she took out a musical instrument rather like a mandolin, and she began to play it with her fingers, a steady, monotonous thrumming that if you didn't notice after a few minutes, but the less you noticed it, the more it got into your brain and your blood, and this also made it hard to think. After she had thrummed for a time, and a sweet smell was now strong, she began speaking in a sweet, quiet voice. Narnia, she said. Narnia. I have oft heard your lordship utter that name in your travel in your ravings. Dear prince, you are very sick. There is no land called Narnia. Yes, there is, though, ma'am, said Pogram. You see, I happen to have lived there all my life. Indeed, said the witch. Tell me, I pray you, where that country is. Up there said Paraglum, stoutly pointing overhead. I, I don't know exactly where. How? <laughs> said the queen with a soft kind of musical laugh. 
Is there a country up among the stones and mortar on the roof? No, said Potaglum, struggling to get his breath. It's in Overworld. And what or where, pray, is this? How do you call it? Overworld? Oh, don't be so silly, said Scrub, who was fighting hard against the enchantment of the sweet smell and the thrumming. As if you didn't know it, it is above, up where you, you can see the sky and the stars and the sun. You, you've been there yourself. We met you there. I cry you mercy, little brother, laughed the witch. You couldn't have heard a lovelier laugh, which is why I'm not going to try to do it. I have no memory of this place, but often we meet our friends in strange places when we dream, and unless all dreamed alike, you must not ask them to remember it. Madam, said the prince sternly, I have already told your grace that I am the king's son of Narnia. And shall be, dear friend, said the witch in a soothing voice as if she were humoring a child, you shall be king of many imagined lands in thy fancies. We've been there too, snapped Jill. She was getting very angry because she could feel enchantment getting hold of her every moment. But of course, this mo very fact that she could feel it showed that it had not yet fully worked. And thou art queen of Narnia too, I doubt not, pretty one, said the queen in a half coaxing, half mocking tone. I'm nothing of this sort, said Jill, stamping her feet. We come from another world. Why, this is a prettier game than the other, said the witch. Tell us, little maid, where is this other world? What ships and chariots go between it and ours? Of course, a lot of things darted into Jill's head at once. Experiment House, Adela Pennyfeather, her own home, radio sets, cinemas, cars, airplanes, ration books, cues. But they seemed dim and far away. Thrum, 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 with the strings on the witch's instrument. And Jill couldn't remember the names of the things in our world. And this time it didn't come into her head that she was being enchanted. For now the magic one is in its full strength. And of course, the more enchanted you get, the more you feel that you are not enchanted at all. She found herself saying, and at the moment it was a relief to say, No, I, I suppose that other world must be all a dream. Yes, it is all a dream, said the witch, always thrumming. There never was such a world, said the witch. No, said Jill, and Scrub. Never was such a world. There never was any world but mine, said the witch. There never was any world but yours, said they. Puddleglum was still fighting hard. I don't know rightly what you mean by a world. He said, talking like a man who hasn't had enough air. But you can't play, you can play that fiddle till your fingers drop off, and still you won't make me forget Narnia and the whole Overlander, too. We may never see it again, I shouldn't wonder. You may have blotted it out and turned it dark like this, for all I know. Nothing is more likely, but I know that there I was there once. I've seen the sky full of stars. I've seen the sun coming up out of the sea of the morning and sinking beyond the mountains at night. And I've seen him in the midday sky when I couldn't look at him for brightness. Puddle Glum's words had a very rousing effect. The other three all breathed again and looked at one another like people newly awakened. Why, there it is, cried the prince. Of course, the blessing of Aslan upon this honest marsh wiggle. We have all been dreaming these last few minutes. How could we have forgotten it? Of course, we've all seen the sun. By Jove, so we have, said Scrub. Good for you, Puddleglum. You're the only one of us with any sense, I do believe. Then came the witch's voice, cooing softly, like the voice of a wood pigeon from the high elms of an old garden at three o'clock in the middle of a sleepy summer afternoon. And she said, What is this sun that you all speak of? Do you mean anything by the word? Yes, we jolly do well do, said Scrub. Can you tell me what it's like? said the witch. 
thrum, thrum, thrum of the strings. Please it, your grace, said the prince, very coldly and politely. You see that lamp, it is round and yellow, and gives light to the whole room, and hangeth moreover from the roof. Now that thing which we call the sun is like the lamp, only far, far greater and brighter. It gives light to the whole overworld, and it hangeth from the sky. Hangeth from what, my lord? asked the witch. And then, when they were all still thinking how to answer, she added with another one of her soft, silvery laughs, You see, when you try to think out clearly what this sun must be, you cannot tell me. You can only tell me it is like the lamp. Your sun is a dream, and there is nothing in that dream that was not copied from the lamp. The lamp is the real thing. The sun is but a tale, a, ch a children's story. Yes, I, I see now, said Jill in a heavy, hopeless tone. It must be so. And when she, while she said this, it seemed to her to be very good sense. Slowly and gravely, the witch repeated, There is no sun. And then they all, and they all said nothing. She repeated in a softer and deeper voice, There is no sun. After a pause and after a struggle in their minds, all four of them said together, You're right. There is no sun. It was such a relief to give in and say it. There never was a sun, said the witch. No, there never was a sun, said the prince and the marsh wiggle and the children. And for the last few minutes, Jill had been feeling that there was something she must remember at all costs, and now she did. But it was dreadfully hard to say it. She felt as if the huge weights were laid on her lips, and at last, with great effort that seemed to take all, all the good out of her, she said, There's Aslan. Aslan, said the witch, quickening ever so slightly the pace for thrumming. What a pretty name. What does it mean? He... He is the great lion who, who called us out of our own world, said Scrub, and, and set us to find Prince Rillian. Who is a lion? asked the witch. No, hang it all, said Scrub. Don't you know? How can we describe it to her? Have you ever seen a cat? Surely, said the witch. I love cats. Well, a lion is a little bit, only a little bit, mind you, like a huge cat cat with a mane. At least, I mean, it's not like a horse's mane, you know. It's more like a judge's wig, and it's, it is yellow, and it's ter terrifically strong. The witch shook her head. I see that we should do no better with your lion, as you call it, than we did with your son. You have seen lamps, and so you imagined a bigger and better lamp, and called it the sun. You've seen cats, and now you want a bigger and better cat, and it's to be called a lion. Well, tis a pretty make-believe, though, to say truth. It would suit you all better if you were younger. And look how you can put nothing into your make-believe world without copying it from the real world. This world of mine, which is the only world. But even you children are too old for such play. And as for you, my lord prince, that art, thou art a man full grown, fie upon you. Are you not ashamed of such toys? Come, all of you, put away these childish tricks. I have work for all of you in the real world. There is no Narnia, no overworld, no sky, no sun, no Aslan. And now, to bed all. And let us begin a wiser life tomorrow. But first, to bed, to sleep, deep sleep, soft pillows, sleep without foolish dreams. The prince and the two children were standing with their eyes half hung down, their cheeks flushed, their eyes half closed, the strength all gone from them, the enchantment almost complete. But Puddleglum, desperately gathering all his strength, walked over to the fire. Then he did a very brave thing. He knew it wouldn't hurt him quite as much as if it would hurt a human. For his feet, which were bare, were webbed and hard and cold-blooded like a duck's. But he knew it would hurt him badly enough. 
and so it did. With his bare foot, he stamped on the fire, grinding a large part of it into ashes on the flat hearth. And three things happened at once. First, the sweet, heavy smell grew very much less. For though the whole fire had not been put out, a good bit of it had, and what remained smelled very largely of burnt marshwiggle, which is not at all an enchanting smell. This instantly made everyone's brain far clearer, and the prince and the children held up their heads again and opened their eyes. Secondly, the witch, in a loud, terrible voice, uttered different, utterly different from the sweet tone she had been using up till now, called out, What are you doing? Dare you touch my fire again, mud filth, and I'll turn the blood to fire inside your veins. Thirdly, the pain itself made Puddleglum's head for a moment perfectly clear, and he knew exactly what he really thought. There is nothing like the good shock of pain for dissolving certain kinds of magic. One word, ma'am, he said, coming back from the fire, limping because of the pain. One word. All you've been saying is quite right, I shouldn't wonder. I'm a chap who's always liked to know the worst and then put the best face on it I can. So I won't deny any of what you've said. But there's one more thing to be said even so. Suppose we have only dreamed or made up all those things, trees and grass and sun and moon and stars and Aslan himself. Suppose we have. All I can say is that in that case, the made-up things seem a good bit more important than your real ones. Suppose this black pit of a kingdom of yours is the only world. Well, that strikes me as a pretty poor one. And that's a funny thing when you think of it. <coughs> We're just babies making up a game, if you're right. But four babies playing a game can make up a play world which licks your real world hollow. That's why I'm going to stand by the play world. I'm on Aslan's side, even if there isn't any Aslan to lead it. I am going to live as like a Narnian as I can, even if there isn't any Narnia. But thanking you kindly for supper, if these two gentlemen and the young lady are ready, we're leaving your court at once and setting out in the dark to spend our lives looking for Overland. Not that our lives will be very long, I should think, but that's small loss if the world's as dull a place as you say. Oh, hooray, good old Puddleglum, cried Scrub and Joe, but the prince suddenly shouted, Beware, look at the witch! And when they did, their hair nearly stood on end. The instrument dropped from her hands. Her arms appeared to be fastened to her side. Her legs were intertwined with each other, and her feet had started to disappear. The long green train of her skirt thickened and grew solid and seemed to be one piece with the writhing green pillar of her interlocked legs. And that writhing green pillar was curving and swaying as if it had no joints or else there were all joints. And her head was thrown far back and all while well, her nose grew longer and longer, every other part of her face seemed to disappear except her eyes. Huge, flaming eyes they were now without brows or lashes. And all this takes... All this takes time to write down. It happened so quickly that there was only just time to see it. Long before there was time to do anything, the change was complete, and the great serpent with the, which the witch had become, green as poison, thick as Jill's waist, had flung two or three coils of its loathsome body round the prince's leg. Quick as lightning, another great loop darted around, intending to pinion his sword to his side, but the prince was just in time. He raised his arms and got them clear, and the living knot only drew round his chest, ready to crack his ribs like firewood when it drew tight. The prince caught the creature's neck in his left hand, trying to squeeze it till it choked. Thank you, David Wisner. The prince caught the creature's neck in his left hand, trying to squeeze it till it choked. This held his face, if you could call it a face, about five inches from his own. The forked tongue flickered horribly in and out, but it could not reach him. With his right hand, he drew back his sword, the strongest blow he could give. Meanwhile, Scrub and Puddleglum had drawn their weapons and rushed to his aid, and all three blows fell at once. Scrubs, which did not even pierce the scales and did no good, on the body of the snake below the prince's hand, but the prince's own blow and Puddleglum's both below on its neck. And even that did not quite kill it, though it began to loosen its hold on Rillian's legs and chest. 
And with repeated blows, they hacked off its head. The horrible thing went on coiling and moving like a bit of wire long after it had died. And the floor, as you may imagine, was a nasty mess. The prince, when he had breath, said, Gentlemen, I thank you. Then the three conquerors stood staring at one another and panting without saying another word for a long time. Jill had very wisely sat down and was keeping quiet. She was saying to herself, I do hope I don't faint or blubber or do something idiotic. My royal mother is avenged, he said really and presently. This is undoubtedly the same worm that I pursued in vain by the fountain in the forest of Narnia so many years ago. All these years I had been the slave of my mother's slayer. Yet I am glad, gentlemen, that the foul witch took her serpent form at the last. It would have not suited well either with my heart or with my honor to have slain a woman. But look to the lady, commanded Jill. I'm all right, thanks, she said. Damsel, said the prince, bowing before her. You are of high courage, and therefore I doubt not you come of noble blood in your own world. But come, friends, here is some wine left. Let us refresh ourselves and each pledge to his fellows. After that, to our plans. A jolly good idea, sir, said the scrub. It's the end of chapter 12. Oh, I think that is one of my favorite scenes in all the Narnia books. Have a wonderful day. Don't drive your parents crazy. <laughs>